the future of the automobile industry um, is no longer in Detroit. The future of the automobile industry is in Connecticut. Uh, the future of the automobile industry is in Yankee tinkering, in which we all specialize, Debian and all. So Jeremiah Foster, um, who is here in his role as longstanding free software Debian guy and what have you, well, there is this thing called Geneva, but that's not actually what we're doing today. We're, we're, we're just talking about the fact that the iconic American object is about to become a free software playground. Uh, and there isn't anybody I can think of who has both played around with more free software and knows more about what's going to happen to the car than Jeremiah Foster. So here we go. Thank you very much, Devin. Thank you, Evan. Um, I was looking at uh, the, some of the credentials of the folks who are speaking here today. It's, uh, it's really quite amazing. But on one page, I think uh, four people mentioned Debian as part of doing something for the project, either representing them, um, being a Debian developer. Um, there was one guy on that page who actually develops for SUSE, but uh, <laughs> we used to. In any case, uh, I think what's key about that is that Debian has played a really central role, I believe, in the spread of free software. It's a real platform for collaboration. Um, and I think uh, we're seeing car companies look to that um, as a way to, to build a rich ecosystem for what they want to do going forward. So let's see if we can do that. Um, this is me. I'm not flying any flag today, really. I, I work for a company based in Sweden called Pelagicor, and I, I also work for Genevi. Um, but I've also been very involved in a group called AGL, certainly in the beginning. I haven't had as much time to do that recently. AGL is a very important uh, group focusing on FOSS and automotive. It's called the Automotive Grade Linux. Uh, it's part of the Linux Foundation. It has very important tier ones and a great deal of software involved. Um, Linux Foundation has a ton of amazing projects. Open Chain, we'll hear about that. And, and I think there's a great deal of synergy. And I think that there's certainly some method to Eben's madness. I think he's collected some very interesting adjacent technologies today. And I think he'll probably tie them up in a very neat bow, um, which is very exciting, because I think there's a lot of synergy. So onward and upward, I'll give you a quick overview of what I have planned. Um, I certainly want to touch on the topics that I think are very important, the automotive future. I will also try and give a quick idea of where we are, but I'm going to try and focus on uh, legal stuff, stuff that I think that this audience will know a bit more than I and where some of the challenges are. Um, the, let's begin at the most logical place, and this is about making money. Automakers need to have a rich media connected vehicle. Full, and when I say rich media, you need everything. You need navigation. You need um, all sorts of stuff that comes from your phone. Because people are, are when you sit in a car by a, a, you know, let's say a high-end vehicle, a car more than $30,000, it's got to perform uh, at least on a par with your telephone. And it's, it's hard to say that many cars do that today. Um, so the car companies can't just go out and buy a platform. You can't put a cell phone in a car. I think many companies are trying to do that, and some companies have done that to a degree. But there's a, it's actually pretty darn complex. And the use cases are, are kind of different, too. The, the car folks use a lot of the same consumer electronics software, but they use it all of it all the time. Um, you have to have music playing while you're doing navigation, while the Bluetooth is connected, and then there are multiple networks inside the car itself with fiber optics, et cetera, et cetera. So they need a platform for this, and, and they needed a way to, to get the consumer electronics experience similar. And um, they found that FOSS could already do what they wanted. I think that the Nokia N9 or the N900 was a pretty good example of the kind of uh, well-connected, carefully built, integrated <coughs> environment that could get developers and, and application engineers up and running really quickly. Um, this was a, a ready-made ecosystem in many ways, too. It had a number of small companies throughout, uh, throughout Europe, certainly, and throughout the world. Um, 
I think that's very attractive to car makers. Auto making, making cars and making software for cars is a global industry. Um, it is, as Eben says, it's not located just in Detroit anymore. And in particular, FOSS is, um, FOSS is also global, so you could tap into this talent anywhere in the world. I think that was extremely attractive. Um, but one of the key things I think about this and, and this particular device is that, um, you know, how do you take that? How do you get this phone operating system? How do you get this complete, rich media device with connectivity onto your car? Do you build this? Do you buy Nokia? How, you know, how do you do that? It turns out to be um, quite difficult. And so you probably do a combination of things. You probably decide that you're going to do both, and in many cases they did. But um, then the first legal challenge arises, and that's compliance with the GPL. In general, car makers have very close relationships in the manufacturing process. They, they rely heavily on their suppliers, the tier ones, extremely heavily. And sometimes they just essentially do a round robin, where they say to one tier one, this is your turn to build the system. Then comes the next one, and it's their turn. It's, it's very difficult to build a rich ecosystem where you can swap out the players. Not least because there's a lot of money involved. It's very expensive to develop not just software, but hardware. And because it's such a strategic industry. You know, there's a, a golden share held, I think, by one of the states in Germany in Volkswagen, which means that, you know, Wolfsburg, the town of Wolfsburg, which was essentially built from a field uh, after the Second World War, Volkswagen can never really leave there. So that, that's just an example of the national interest in the automotive industry across the globe. There are a lot of jobs at stake. Uh, Bosch, for example, tier one with 385,000 employees. And so bringing on FOSS brings in the challenge of compliance. That, that is new. The relationship with these companies is now much looser. You're using tier twos. You're using different software development practices. It's not mechanical engineering. And uh, just understanding the licenses is, has been a significant challenge. I think um, Dave Marr, who will speak or talk about these kinds of things later today when he talks about the open chain, is going to have a, uh, I think it's going to have a significant impact on the automotive industry if it hasn't happened already. But you know, I think fundamentally, um, the, the great advantage of free software, as, as much as um, I, I don't think it can be overemphasized. It's, it's copyleft that enabled this. It really is the power of copyleft. It's the way that the GPL protects that intellectual property along with the implementation of the code that allowed an automotive industry to essentially scoop up a ready-made operating system with rich media and connectivity and put it in their vehicles today. Copyleft preserved, essentially, a, a vast platform that was ready to be productized that was pretty much left for dead, that was killed in something called the allopolis. Um, and that power is, is incredible. <laughs> this huge amount of value that sort of got transferred from one company into an ecosystem and was preserved thanks to, thanks to copyleft itself. But it, it brings different, different things. It, it brings a fundamentally new view of, of intellectual property, I believe. Car companies have a great deal of patents in mechanical engineering, in alloys. BMW makes uh, alloys that are very rare, that only they know how to make, and their engines that make them lighter, more powerful. Um, obviously, they want to protect that. That's a competitive advantage. And car makers are not software companies. They're trying to become software companies. That's a huge challenge. And their partners, and certainly operating system vendors in the embedded space, captured a lot of the know-how, a lot of the understanding, um, especially when it comes to compliance. You know, companies like Wind River are really good at this. Uh, thank goodness that they're, they're sharing their information in projects like Open Chain today. But this, this is a challenge. It's a cultural shift. It's a new way of thinking. Um, even if copyleft presented them a huge opportunity, it still remains today a significant challenge. Although I do think that um, it's, it's largely becoming solved. There's, there's certainly a set of best practices. 
how do automotive companies respond to these kinds of challenges? For them, it's always process. It's about process. It's about controlling the supply chain. They've really got some in innovations there that I think that you know, software development is copied, like Kanban. There's uh, all sorts of lean manufacturing processes. Um, but they really turn to an alliance system. That's their way of collaborating. And open source software presents an extremely fast model of doing that, you, because you can distribute code all across the world in real time. So what car companies tried to do was impose their collaborative model over on top of that. And you see AGL, Geneva, and AutoZar. Those are just three of the, the organizations that are working um, very closely with open source. There are significant challenges. I mean, I, if we look at these companies, the only one that was really born open was the automotive grade Linux. That, that comes from a tradition that goes way back. And these folks, you know, they swim in CopyLab. They completely understand it. Geneva was really born as a, more of a proprietary organization that's had to move into the open. And that presents really significant challenges. It's great because it's given us an opportunity to expose automakers to best practices in open source software development. And, and that has huge bonuses. Um, and it's led to greater adoption. But you know, in a lot of ways, AGL can move a lot more quickly. Then we see this other organization, AutoZar, which is um, much more about the low level operating system and the network stack. And they're sort of adopting Geneva's approach, but they have, you know, they, they share a specification and then they compete on implementation, whereas Geneva doesn't share its specification, but does share its implementation. So how are these cultures going to merge? I mean, it's, I think it's endemic of these cultural problems that automakers have and their tier one suppliers have with copyleft and the collaboration that copyleft engenders. Uh, there's a lot of legal work to do on that particularly in structuring bylaws of open source organizations that can effectively uh, move quickly with software development. Then let's add, another, let's, let's add another layer. So that's where we are today. We do have today a rich ecosystem of FOSS in the car, mostly serving what's called IVI systems, in-vehicle infotainment. The next step is to begin to create things called clustertainment or to combine the safety critical aspects with the infotainment aspects. There are a bunch of reasons for that, some of them technical. Um, modern processors are much more powerful. Um, you can do a lot more than you could in the past, and car makers want to run one operating system on both. They want to merge this into literally what's called a big brain. Um, that's going to present a very interesting challenge. Uh, we're going to have to, to uh, address issues of safety. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons that at least policymakers are willing to be so tolerant about autonomous vehicles is it's going to save lives. There's no question about it. And I, I, think, uh, I think that also kind of in a way gives automakers a free hand to try and, and put on this permissionless innovation model. Um, and certainly FOSS is going to play a huge part there. Um, just a tiny bit of background on that. You know, software is really key in safety. It's going to play a huge role. Um, so, and FOSS is, as people say, it's eating the world. So I think that we really need to address this very carefully. Quality control, safety control, certification, all those things are going to have to be addressed. Um, this is a little bit more on that. Um, it's only interesting, I think, from a, a process perspective, but it has a significant impact on, on what's going to be <clears throat> legal issues. There's a set of standards that are relevant for safety. Some of them are in similar industries. You need to make sure your software conforms to these standards. That's a very expensive process. You have to certify both your hardware and your software. How are we going to, to meld those things with, um, with FOSS? In fact, when you look in the headers of a FOSS file, you'll see that it comes with no warranty. How do you address liability? So this is Mark Rackle. I think um, one of the big challenges with corporate liability is the no warranty deals with contractual liability. 
Um, but right now, um, the whole area of liability for benefit for for development time is very important. Right. Um, there doesn't appear to be um, any standard. There's no reasonable man standard that they come up with for negligence. And just to give you an example, in the car industry, when Toyota had the unanticipated acceleration, they had a group of technologists looking at the source code. They had a group of It's unmuted. Okay. Sorry. So I'm just—I was just saying that the potential liability under tort theory is very uncertain. Um, it's actually something I've looked at for a client, so I've done a relatively deep dive. And the challenge is that the you know in tort, at least in the U.S., it's either negligence or strict liability in tort. Um, so far, people have been using the negligence theory, and the, uh, the decisions have been all over the map. Uh, and as a practical matter, it's very unclear how uh, the negligence theory would treat um, a collaborative project like FOSS. Uh, more importantly, it, it's very difficult to track down the actual cause. I, mean, I was just saying that when, for the unanticipated acceleration, uh, to, uh, they spent, uh, they had a series of experts who went and looked at the source code for about um, 18 months, and, and they were not able to actually pin down what caused the unanticipated acceleration. Mm. Least, although Toyota later settled it. But Sounds like Dieselgate, too. Yeah. I mean, they, they couldn't figure that out, what that was happening in the admissions. Well, well that, was just pure, that was just pure fraud. I mean, the unanticipated acceleration sure. was something wasn't operating correctly, and that was all, virtually all the software was made by uh, Toyota. There's uh, there some interaction with some NEC chips and other stuff. But yep. it's going to be a very difficult challenge. There's a book called Overcomplicated, mm. which talks about this too, which, uh, which is we may have to rethink our liability theories because I would totally uh, things agree. have become, become way too complex to actually get to the root cause. I agree. And car makers want unlimited liability in North America at least. So. It's a huge challenge. And I think what I'm trying to show here is that this is the automaker's or an engineer's approach to dealing with this issue um, in software. I don't know that um, we're really going to get there necessarily, even following the automaker's approach, the industry approach. But there is attempt to make FOSS certified for ISO 26262, which is the car certification for safety critical. It would not be at the highest level. It would be at a... a lower level here, what's called ASIL B, um, but um, that's pretty significant. Uh, and I think that uh, if we can create a body of knowledge that reaches those certification levels, then I think we can start discussing liability, but I think that we've got something interesting. We've got a commons there, a base to work from. Um, these are some of the technical details. Uh, they're relevant, again, because we get to t and uh, in the GPLv3. The GPLv3 is um, a very popular software license because it's a very good software license. It does present perhaps some challenges in safety critical. At least in automotive, what you want to do is you want to create a signed, cryptographically signed bootloader. So you create a chain of trust so that each component that builds upon the component that booted before it also inherits that trust. This is the way with, let's say, reproducible builds and other approaches, this is the way we can know that the software is going to be tamper-proof. Um, <clears throat> Yellow. Oh, Jim, sorry. Why do you want it to be tamper-proof? <laughs> Why would, why, why, would, why would we want it to be tamper-proof? That seems antithetical to the idea of open source. Seems like we should be able to self-sign. Uh, we're going to just have the same debate right. we had about secure boot five years ago. Absolutely. That, that's exactly right, and it is the same debate. Um, this time, I think the argument is that if you allow the consumer to change the software in the car, 
the, the car might be impacted such that the consumer could suffer injury and that the car maker would be blamed. I guess that goes to the liability questions yeah, that Mark I, was I raising. Think, yep. Right. Please. Uh, is there a further worry that um, if, if the consumer replaces the software on the car, uh, they perhaps, if we move to the era of self-driving cars, they perhaps uh, write more selfish algorithms than uh, manufacturers are willing to uh, put out? And uh, uh, in turn, uh, I, I guess create a, a more selfish system that actually leads to more accidents? Gosh, yeah, that's an incredible question. I, I wouldn't know where to begin, although I, I'm sure that's the case. I, I will tell you this, is that it's probably a combination of, of liability, but it's also a combination of wanting to keep your customer. Um, they're brand machines, car companies. They, they bend metal. They do very brilliant business, but their, their brand, their marketing is extremely powerful. They're also supply chain managers. And I think every opportunity in the infotainment system, let's say, or, or even in the cluster now, and, and the electronics and the software is an opportunity to build a customer relationship. And I think that there's a business relationship they don't want interfered with there. I think sometimes they'll point to safety and say, no, you can't change the software on the car because it's dangerous. But I think they're also saying, no, you can't disintermediate between me and my customer because that's my profit. Some car companies sell cars at cost. Their profit will come in the aftermarket. If you have a software system that sits between the car and the customer, the software system might say, huh, I noticed that your right tire seems to be a bit flat. You've got extraordinary wear. Here is the closest tire changing center that we happen to have received money from to advertise. And oh yeah, they don't sell official parts, but it's cheaper. That, that's a significant blow to the car companies. So I think it's this combination of how do we resolve the liability issue, which I think is clear and justifiable, um, along with how do we keep the data, the customer data, how do we monetize these new uh, channels with the customer and how do we preserve our customer relationship and our brand? That's my guess. Um, I think that there are, um, <clears throat> you know, as I mentioned, I think that the, this effect mostly happens at the lowest level. I think as Jim was saying that we're going through the same argument we had with, with Trusted Boot before. I think we probably end up in the same place. There are some interesting things happening now. There's one large truck, commercial vehicle manufacturer, who is going to allow the replace of only GPLv3 components in the system. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but so, yeah. So I talked with the open source person. So I talked to the open source person or major vehicle manufacturer who remained nameless. He says they prohibit all use of V3. In their, in their, I would say all use in the actual yeah. control systems. Yeah. Uh, we didn't get into IVI. They all ban it. In, in Geneva, we had a, a task force when GPL V3 came up. We had a task force and we're going to blacklist it. And yet, almost all car makers ship it. All of them. Literally. And they know it. And they, you know, they speak out of one side of their mouth. No, you'll never have GPL V3 in the car, except for all the cars that we're making now. I don't, I don't know what to say. I think that's why things like open chain are so important. Um, either they don't have introspection into their software systems, or, uh, yeah, or, or their policy decisions are just 180 degrees different from what they actually can do. Um, and I think that there's, there's a great deal of flexibility. I mean, how do we get around some of these questions that they won't? They won't ship GPLv3. They can't ship for whatever reason. I think in Germany there are some laws um, that, it, depending on the way they're interpreted, um, might imply that you can't have GPL. But I think that there, are, you know, for example, these in situ updates to just GPLv3 binaries. I don't know how that's going to go. I think do think marketing education is going to go a long way. I think if people finally understand how the GPLv3 is a is a better license and, and how we can comply with that. I think that will have a significant difference. I also think that 
one of the ways around it people do is they use uh, GPLv2. They go, they go to older versions. That's not, that's not sustainable in the long run. You can't stick with these older versions of things, particularly Bash. That's something that everybody loves and needs to have the latest version. And then the, the fantastic thing about the GPLv3 is that it's more like the GPL spirit in general. It's modifiable. You can craft exceptions. Um, I think that's a very powerful tool. And I think that, that might be a great opportunity to be used in, in safety critical space. Um, that's where we're going. We're going towards a, a combination of safety critical, certification, uh, different liability scheme. So a lot to talk about for lawyers. I think also that you know, we need to address um, as customers, as consumers, you know, in these complex embedded systems, average cars, 100 million lines of code, how do we trust them? It's, it's difficult for the regulators to understand. Uh, the airline industry has huge numbers of inspectors, and the car industry has quite few. Um, and the stakes are very high. And I, I really think that uh, open source and continuing to use the power of copyleft is going to be a great opportunity, not just for the car companies to build uh, advanced platforms, but for customers to trust the software, for regulators to understand how it works, for insurers to be able to be confident that what they're insuring is being used in that manner. Um, I just think it provides the needed transparency for a, a more autonomous world. So that's my premise, um, and that's my talk. So uh, that wasn't a quote from Volkswagen, right? That, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. It was. Uh, it, it, yeah, right. Uh, I do too, but but I wrote it. So so the uh, so the thing I think you're 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 saying, which um, which Mark has helped us to locate, uh, is that from the lawyer's point of view, we have a couple of different issues here. One one is the liability nightmares when software is in everything and the things move at high speed and they crash into stuff. Uh, and one of them is a right to repair that we haven't exactly talked about yet. So if you could take a couple of seconds to talk about what you think that that right to repair part of all this is and how this relates to the yeah. traditional view of the automobile industries about yeah. aftermarket service and how it works, I think that would also be very helpful. I, I think that's a pretty straightforward um, business issue. I think that the right to repair limits the opportunity for um, cars to get profit in the aftermarket, which is a very expensive proposition. I also think that you know uh, there were large open source companies that had established track records in other industries that tried to come into the car business, and they would say, well, why can't people change their software? I mean, they, there's right to repair. I don't understand. People can change their tires, and you allow that. Why can't you allow people to use GPLv3 and change their software? And the car companies really don't have much of an answer to that, uh, they just, um, yeah, we've never really had access to, to auto industry lawyers. Um, they're, they don't engage, I think, in, in many cases. So it, it would be hard to, it would be hard to see how they reconcile right to repair with, um, with their current policies. And yet after Volkswagen, how are they exactly going to hold that position in your mind? I, I don't think it's defensible. I, I really don't. I, I don't see how that that's going to work. And it's not just Volkswagen. I mean, there are, there are numerous. Yeah, there are numerous issues, you know. And who's liable here? If if the tier one, as you say, was responsible for it, and the tier one told the car maker, "Don't do this," and the car maker, "Well, we did it anyway. Um, we're going to do it." Uh, who's who's liable? So we have an idea that the trust basis of the software in the automobile is essentially a safety criticality question. If we can't trust that software, then people will get hurt. But we recognize an anti-competitive motive that lies underneath it, which is the desire of the manufacturer to tie after sale service to one degree or another to the entity, the car itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Mark is surely right that this is going to turn out to be a case-by-case -case 
set of subjects with respect to the liability for the software design, but it isn't going to turn out to be a case-by-case -case tort law question with respect to what is the balance between safety criticality and inspectability and uh, free competition in the right aftermarket service. So that's going to be a regulatory determination. It's going to be a legislative question in the end. How do we balance the anti-competitive consequences against safety criticality and the trust it appears to require? Not having GPL3 in the car means not having aggressive protection of users' rights in a place where that forces a public policy decision to be made. I think your suspicion, therefore, is in a way like mine, that really what we are having is not a conversation about safety and not a conversation about GPL3. We're having a conversation about how to make that public, public policy balance in future. Absolutely. And in, in regards to regulation, I think there's a great deal of regulatory capture in the auto industry. One in seven jobs in Germany are in the automotive industry. So how do we... How do we do this uh, well and, and keep those industries that we want so much, I think? So let's go back to this uh, safety criticality and focus on the licenses in relation to it. Mm. When Richard and I made the first draft of GPL3 for public discussion, uh, we put a provision in it that said this software is not for safety critical uses. Uh -huh. uh, and um, what happened next, as the people in the room uh, will remember, Richard Fontana now is my carrier of memory. As I get old, he remembers the details of all of this better than I do. But <laughs> my recollection is people came to us and they said, you know, you should take that out again. Because if you leave really? that not for safety critical uses provision in there, then we're going to be trapped by it. And, and, and our software might wind up, wind up winding up in places where it could be argued that it is for safety critical uses, and then you will have blown up the license, and we will be very unhappy with you. Mm. And I at least thought that was a hell of a good argument, and Richard thought that there were more important fish to fry the day, and we were just doing that because we thought people might want a disclaimer in there, so let's just take it out, mm. and we removed it. I think I understood you to say that was a good idea on our part because we really need to find out how to use this stuff under this copyleft license in safety critical applications and it's a good idea that we didn't wall them out of the license. Did I understand you right? I think it worked out that way, absolutely. Yeah. On the other hand, if we're going to guarantee people the right to modify, copy, and redistribute and installation information to put it in user products, then there is a real risk that nobody will apply the license to the code. And that's what I think Mark was saying, and you right. were agreeing, is what everybody wishes the rules were. The only problem is work must get done, and there's copylefted code which will do it, so they use it anyway. Exactly. Okay, now, now, now that's not a very stable outcome. Do you care to predict the future on this? What's going to happen? <laughs> is, the, is the no GPL3 rule going to bend, or is it that everybody's going to decide to spend what it takes to get the GPL3 code out of the car? Um, I think the, the rule will be ignored. And I know that, you know, I, last week a semiconductor manufacturer uh, somewhat hostile to open source, asked me, you know, can Geneva, for example, get rid of the GPL v3? And it's just, no, it's just absolutely impossible. I, it, it's not going anywhere. Regulatory capture. Change. We can also we can also the license and make it unlawful for us to exercise our rights. Yeah. Congress. Well, yeah. that's one possibility. Mike, what do you think about this in automotive grade Linux? What, what, what's, the, what's the outcome going to be in HEL? Uh, I'm sorry. I just got to notice my flight was delayed. What was it? Oh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can stay longer. Great. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll put you on the hot seat then. <laughs> GPLv3 in cars. So, yeah, what's going to happen in HEL? Is HEL going to be a GPLv3 zone, uh, free zone forever? You know, AGL is, when we talk about AGL, it's about 80% of, you know, the common stack that OEMs will use. AGL has, you know, eight of you know, the premier brands that you think about, like Toyota, Ford, Jaguar, Land Rover, Mazda, you know, the, these companies are really looking for, you know, building a core plumbing together. Um, there's always going to be the extra 20%. There's going to be the customizations, and like Jeremiah pointed out, many of them are already shipping something that has GPLv3 today. Um, 
I think that when you look at you know the risk landscape as you know attorneys are wont to do, there's a number of things that will influence their decision around which packages they accept today. There will be uh, influences on what packages they choose to accept tomorrow. And um, you know, there's a number of conflating factors, I think, that come into play when they look at GPL v3 as an example. Um, as a license, it may you know, not be much of an issue, but you know, there's some you know, issues that come up in certain jurisdictions. And if they're subject to you know, a two-week response to a, um, uh, you know, a claim by somebody that um, you know, they have copyright and they're going to you know, be able, cease be able to ship cars into a yeah. country, yeah, that, uh, that uh, that's a big deal. <laughs> that is a daunting risk you, to uh, analyze as a car manufacturer. You can't stop the production line. That's yeah, just, just you can't stop expensive. the production line. And so, you know, th you know, just the threat of an injunction in, you know, a certain jurisdiction where yeah. you know that response time is very quick is is, you know, something that I, I suspect you know many companies will be taking into account, not just automotive. So, I, I don't know that it's going to be necessarily all that much more different. Like, like you said, they're already using it, but you know that could change depending on, you know, where the broader ecosystem goes and how things work out. Well, somebody said Congress. I mean, yeah. Yeah. at one point the Justice Department asked Microsoft to license some software under the GPL two. I think it was a while back. I mean, can't we Must do something? <laughs> can't can't we do something along those lines, uh, with some of the plumbing in the car? Well, I thought that was an interesting comment of yours, Jeff. Too. Um, it used to be that Congress would act speedily and for sure because congressmen had automobile dealerships in every single district, and they were really important people. Um, this too seems to me to have a new post Volkswagen history to it, however, because. Uh, as we know, VW has just finished figuring out how much it's going to cost to deal with ticked off U.S. dealers at the same time that they're settling their class action mm -hmm. lawsuit and deciding to spend $10 billion buying vehicles back. That is, with respect to the problems that software creates in cars, dealers may not be exactly the people going to Congress and saying, would you please immunize my manufacturer for me? in quite the same way that they might have been uh, even half a generation ago. I don't actually understand how dealers are going to wind up thinking about the software in those cars. It's true that they really do want the aftermarket repair business, yeah. but I think they also want the customer relationship, and I'm not absolutely certain that in the bargaining between the manufacturers and the dealers assisted by congressmen, liability is going to be o the only part of that story. Mm -hmm. I think who gets the data is also going to be almost as important as it was between Stephen P. Jobs and the AT AT&T at the opening of the iPhone era. Whose relationship is that? And yeah. who gets to mine that data and who ought to? And how does a guy like Elon Musk, if I, I, I don't want to out you as a Tesla driver, but I, I believe you were the first free software lawyer I knew who was also an Elon Musk customer. How does a guy who wants to change the traditional structure of relationship between manufacturer and driver mm -hmm. Uh, also a malleable concept, uh, deal with this question of the, the automobile dealer's um, uh, particular uh, 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 interests. Every time I have wandered into the right to repair and free software issues with respect to automobiles in my career, the dealers were way more difficult from a political mm -hmm. point of view, let us say, than the manufacturers. Do you have a way of thinking about the, 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 the offset politics between the dealers and the manufacturers with respect to free software in the car? I don't so much. I mean, I think that Tesla is, is showing that you don't need dealers. Um, and I think that with the car companies working like GM with Lyft and Volvo with Uber, um, they're disintermediating the dealers again. I also think that, as you were saying, services, software services on the car, like BMW, I believe, is going into advertising. Um, you know, I think those questions are at the fore, as you say, and I don't know that dealers have a tremendous amount of power in an autonomous driving future when, when people are not that interested in buying, a, you know, a V8 with now. If I were real, now if I were real good, oh, I'm sorry, Danny, did you want to? Just one quick question about another set of players. Um, uh, we've been 
poking around in my lab on the structure of just regular cars, forget about autonomous vehicles. And surprisingly, I think some of the manufacturers don't even know very much or control very much about many of the components in their cars. It's the OEMs. Um, and my sense is that might be a convenient relationship for the manufacturers who just kind of package all this stuff and it may have some liability limiting functions that way. But I'm, I'm curious when you look at the, the licensing dynamics, um, how, do the, how do the OEMs uh, fit into this equation? Uh, actually, I think the OEMs have the discussion with the, the silicon vendors. Uh, there's a lot that the OEMs want to do with, with new generations of silicon. Traditionally, the CPU powered the infotainment system. It was weak. It was a per-part item. You know, Ford would cancel an infotainment head unit because of two pennies. Now, uh, the CPUs are extremely powerful. They're much more expensive, and they're a feature that not will only enable autonomous driving, but will enable... Uh, rich media and, you know, things like there are going to be 20 cameras in the car. In some cases, there already are. You know, the rear view camera is mandated. All the mirrors are going to be cameras. There's going to be uh, drowsy driving detection, et cetera. So it's the OEM and silicon vendor that are talking a great deal, um, which is why so many silicon vendors are invested so heavily in, in AGL, in Geneva, in Linux. Um, and then I see it bubbling up to the tier ones. Um, the tier ones, are, they make the hardware. You know, they're traditionally the ones who, I mean, they've got a great deal of power, these manufacturers. And they traditionally do know a fair amount, not necessarily on the software side, but certainly on how these things, these black boxes are constructed. Um, so th I think they're going to be the big gatekeeper for those companies that want to go over the top, that want to do, say, HTML, or just want to do data services in the car. I think it's one thing to go to the handset market, which is a relatively small device, another thing to go to 30,000 European vehicle um, and try and disintermediate that tier one. Um, but you know, it's not clear how the relationships are, and it, the automakers want to break the lock of software on the hardware. Usually you would get, each time you had a new model, you'd get a new radio, radio hardware and the same so and different software would come. Now they're mandating that there's an ecosystem of software and that the OEMs themselves write the software and they point and they say, you're going to put this software on that hardware. That sinks the hardware costs, it gives you price transparency, allows code reuse, all these things that open source brings, but it's unclear exactly um, both liability and exactly what the business relationships are. Uh, and now then this, this word autonomous has been spoken and the duck fell out of the ceiling because that was the magic word this time, right? So, so now we used to have these things called cars which freed people by allowing them to move themselves around and now we're about to be unable to tell the difference between a car and a robot mm -hmm. and um, travel is a service and some platform travels you. Yep. Um, I, I don't have any doubt that at that point uh, I really want to know about AGPL V3 in cars. That is yeah. to say, I'm the recipient of a service that could kill me. Could I, could, could I please understand how this is here driving is done? Um, and, and, and so what is the level of transparency which is appropriate in the software control of transportation as a service. If I, if I get into an airplane, it is now assumed that there's no reason I should need to read all the airframe software in the 777, although there might be times when I think that would be a good idea, or at least, or at least as Chris Ferris was saying this morning, if my mother's going to be on the plane, I might want to be able to check its repair record on the net before the flight leaves. And maybe it's just the American in me that I grew up driving a manual shift automobile, but I find it very difficult to believe that after all those years training myself not to die on the highway that I'm going to decide that that's a thing that should be left to other people or to machinery for me and that I'm going to have no way to check. So yeah. what should we think of as the, desi the socially desirable level of users' rights in autonomous transportation. Never mind right now whether the licenses are giving them to us. Let's just try and figure out what is the what is the policy objective with respect to autonomous individual vehicular transportation. What should the level of users' rights be? Man, 
I think we need to think about that long and hard. I, I think we have little time, because I think a, little, a lot of autonomous driving is a little bit further off than they like to make it say. I think that a lot of this is marketing. This sells cars today. Um, so I don't know. I, I think. Well, I'm with you about this, right? I mean, I have been a skeptic about artificial intelligence since before I had my first programming job. I, <laughs> I think driving cars is actually really hard. It involves vision and coordination and many other things that my artificial intelligence inventing colleagues have had a very hard time inventing their way to. So, so I think I'm with you that this is all a little less, that this is all a little less real than it seems. Right. But your point that the regulators around the world love it and have decided to lie down and let it happen, mm. um, maybe because they think it's going to mean fewer dead babies or for a variety of other reasons they want it, means that even though it is technologically very far off and I am deeply skeptical, the governments really do seem to me to want to just say, yeah. Go okay. on through, at which point how I feel about users' rights becomes really important to me yeah. because I don't actually expect government regulators to be the leading edge of figuring out how users' rights should work. Karen, you want to say something? I, I was just going to ask if, if the autonomous is a fairly short period of time because I think you have to move to intelligent traffic. I mean, learning how to drive a car as though there are no other cars on the road mm. is, is you know, one thing. Learning how to drive a car that talks to all the other cars on the road is another thing, and that talks to the traffic lights and that talks to, I mean, I, years ago I read a paper that said that the number one thing you could do in the world to reduce air pollution is to have intelligent traffic. And we sort of have it with ways in some ways, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but I, I, you know, the way I envision it is that once cars have to talk to each other, that safety-wise, not having the code available because it's going to be on all cars. There's not going to be a you know an, an advantage to one car. If you're going to be at a disadvantage if you don't talk well to everybody else, they're all going to want to share that risk. They're all going to want to open that. And and I think the um, the answer on the you know on the on the support side is that that there are very few of us that really want to fuss with the actual operation of our car as opposed to the in-vehicle infotainment potentially. Sure. And, um, and there'll be other ways for them to encourage you know, the use of, of somebody who is uh, you know, more intimately involved in that particular car implementation than others. But I think, you know, I think we're, gonna, we're, we're gonna at some point jump to that intelligent traffic mode where this is not a single car company issue. And at that point, Absolutely. we have to have it open. Absolutely. Well, that's one possible outcome, which is kind of why I'm really sort of eager to do this in my usual anarchist way, by trying to decide what people's rights are first and lock them in before everybody else starts making all the other deals. I, I really do then just sort of want to understand, we used to think this object meant freedom. And, and it may be true that a lot of people didn't want to mess with it, but I have to tell you that there were a lot of people who wanted to mess with cars back when it was still possible to mess with cars. At age 16, I was one of them. The cultural desire to mess with cars had to do mm. with the sense of possibility of actually accomplishing something. I knew how to change what an engine did by messing with its carburetor. There was no way to do that after anti-pollution reduced my right to mess around with carburetors. And, and that's a social trade worth having. So the question, what is street legal, may be a really important question, yeah. which isn't exactly the same as what should users' rights in autonomous transport be. In the, world of the, in the world of the car I drove myself, whether it was street legal basically had to do with how much I wanted to push the envelope in the behavior of my car. And my right, in that sense, was to decide how far I could go towards having it behave my way at whatever cost to other people, like the coal rollers nowadays who yeah. really want to punk all that stuff out the pipe just to prove they're not politically correct. Okay, that's fine. But when it's an autonomous vehicle, it's not so much about how it behaves in traffic. It's not so much about whether it obeys the speed limit or whether it makes a right turn from the left lane. What I actually care about is whether when I get into it, I am absolutely certain it's going to take me where I want to go instead of somebody else's decision about where I should go, like jail or 
the ocean or, right? I do not actually want to say that just because every car on the road has to negotiate with every stanchion and pole and car for me to be safe, that that means that I have given up that fundamental right to move around freely, which was so important to the American automobile and the way we culturally understood it. Jeff, did I, I know you don't think of this the same way, but you have to... Do you ask that same question about your elevator? <laughs> oh, now that's really odd. As, as you know, the, the thing that, that, that uh, Jeremiah took that statement about unsafe building material from, which is contained somewhere in this block of material. Yeah, in my um, notes, of course, I, I, I credit made a, that to I, you. I made a statement when I gave that speech in Edinburgh about elevators. And when I republished it recently, I got a note from an elevator guy out on the West Coast who said, you know, Eben, you're really underestimating the total amount of vicious proprietary software in elevators nowadays. And if you were in my business repairing elevators, this would be much clearer to you than it is. So, so actually, I, and my answer, Jeff, is yeah, I'm learning to think about elevators that way, educated by many fine people who think more about elevators than I do. But when I get into an elevator, although it could take me to the basement, and something bad could happen there, even if I have pressed six, I don't feel quite as concerned to understand its control mechanisms as I do about the car. And that, again, has to do with the fact that I was a child of the automobile culture in the 20th century, and I really did think that my right to take my car across the continent and drive it whichever route I wanted to and stop for dinner wherever I felt like was something that the United States Supreme Court had told me in 1869 in Crandall, Nevada, I was allowed to do. I thought the freedom of interstate travel was about the car. I don't know if everybody's going to feel that after the Uber, Lyft, et cetera, robotization deals. That seems Let's important. not miss Greg or uh, David. Okay, um, Volkswagen put a highlight on the fact that um, the code itself and control systems is very simple. The real logic is the data tables. And data tables, as we all know, have odd copyright issues. Um, autom uh, autonomous cars are the same way. Mm -hmm. Usually AI-driven, huge data tables of you get this input, what do I do next is my output. So the code can be open, but yet your data and control might not be. And third-party car modders today have that same issue because they're just modifying control tables. Absolutely What about the true. license issues of those? You just tables? bought people, you just bought people another three seconds of Friday night because now I don't have to say at the other end of the day what I was going to say, which is come back next year, we're going to talk about free software licensing and machine learning because I think you're exactly right. I yeah. think that's the biggest conceptual challenge that we have bar none right now because what computer programs are is changing in that fundamental way everywhere. And the training data and the tables and all the other stuff that really makes software interesting and powerful in the next part of the 21st century doesn't have copyright licensing like we got after 1979, and licenses don't work the same way. In fact, I think that's how they're getting around things like the GPL. Okay, the code is open, no big deal, but the data is proprietary. And I think that happened with Mobileye and Tesla. Mobileye gives you all this information, but it doesn't give you the actual image. So you can't introspect it. But wait a second, I bought this. This is my data. It comes from my car. I want to do stuff with it. Nope, sorry. Wow. And that's, that's going to be a huge challenge. Um, so I'd like to at least raise the possibility that um, the fundamental proposition that open software leads to safer um, building materials um, is maybe an epiphenomenon of the fact of multiple eyes on open software. In other words, um, uh, you have a certain redundancy when the software is open. Um, I uh, go back about 15 or 20 years ago, I interviewed a software engineer at Boeing. Um, I believe it was the 747, the flight control system was programmed <coughs> with proprietary code by three different teams on three different processors using three different C compilers, and I asked why C. Well, there are three different compilers, so okay. But the code was proprietary, and um, the way it worked, when all three systems agreed, 
three black boxes agreed uh, the um, operation was normal. When one of the systems went out of range, then the pilot was called in, there was an alert, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they were three black boxes that um, weren't necessarily open, weren't necessary, weren't open, weren't transparent, but they were just redundant and all programmed to do the same thing in three different ways. So, um, uh, it, is, is it possible that, I mean, I feel a little bit weird um, uh, pushing back on the whole idea of open software because I fundamentally believe in many of its strengths. But in this case, um, is it possible that it isn't the openness of the software, it's just the, the um, relatively bug-freeness of it? And wouldn't it be better to have two different open software teams writing the controller for the autonomous vehicle and making uh, driver control systems that had to agree with each other? Well, that's actually what we have. You know, uh, you look at the automotive industry, they, they pick among their partners. And yeah, open source is there, but every single one of the car partners are making the exact same system. They're all developing the same thing, maybe with different bugs, maybe with the same bugs. So we have multiple black boxes, all open source. I think in the same car. Um, that's no. How the, that's how the flight controller works. There were right. three they do separate redundancy. flight controllers yeah. in one airplane. Cars don't do that kind of redundancy. Boy, wouldn't it be better if they did? Well, and, and then there's how much does your car cost, and, and so on. David, let me... Yeah, so, uh, to me, that's a great segue to a comment that I wanted to make as well. So, um, you know, we mentioned a particular car manufacturer earlier, an electric one, and, you know, in that system, the infotainment system can actually crash, and yet the automobile can still function, mm. the driving functions. Um, so, architecturally, you know, the separation seems like it's, it's there. Um, the... If if we were to look down the path and sort of you know try to see if regulation were to happen in this space, what would it potentially take form as? Um, I can easily see a situation where, uh, as a black box, if you will, the safety critical systems, all the driving functions, all the autonomous uh, navigation functions, are all sort of in a black box. I you know if if the black box has an issue. It should provide some idiot light that comes up and says, you know, stop, stop operating, or you know, maybe the car pulls will, pulls to the side. But the point is, uh, it's the it's a level of sophistication where, um, having visited, you know, a number of car dealerships, I would not want my safety critical systems to be modified by, if they had a Jeremiah back there, sure. But you know, my my belief that they they would have that level of technical competence to modify this module um, would be very low. So. If it was, if I had my druthers, I would want to find some balance between the ability to, to modify uh, on the infotainment side, um, but find some some balance so that you know the the issues that I think we're all thinking about on the safety side, you know, have some type of path forward. Um, and it doesn't mean completely closed to me either. If there's if there's a code in there that can be examined and improved. Um, uh, perhaps that should be open, and so perhaps some type of public interest project to, to cause it to happen. Now, I do know that we could talk about this all afternoon. The beauty of this topic is everybody has an opinion because it's cars, yeah. which, is, which, is, which is part of why I wonder how we could wind up in a world where everybody has an opinion and nobody has any rights. In our general world, we, we think that the real point about the freedom of the software is you can back your opinion with your code and then see what works. And it may very well be that people aren't going to believe that about automobiles. Stay tuned. Come back next year. We'll talk about medical devices and see how people <laughs> feel then. But there they're going to feel different because it's not their cars. All right, this is a conversation to continue, but not at the expense of your, evident, of your eventually being able to leave this conference. So I want to say thank you to Jeremiah thank and to everybody much. for caring about cars, and we'll move on. <laughs>